I'm David Basinger, formerly a professor of philosophy and ethics and now the chief academic officer at Roberts Wesleyan College. Uh, TED Talks are short, focused discussions of contemporary issues by experts. Red Talks are Roberts TED Talks. They are short, focused discussions on issues of interest by Roberts experts. We're going to have three speakers this morning. Each one will speak for, or the team will speak for 15 minutes, and then there will be five minutes of, of question and answer. Our first presenter this morning is Carrie Starr. Carrie's been here. Oh, Carrie's been here 10 years. She's an assistant professor of business. She's the Hoselton Chair for Ethics and Free Enterprise, and she's also the director of Enactus, which some of you are familiar with. Her topic is the power of team. Let's welcome Carrie. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for waking up early on a beautiful fall day to be here with us. Um, about, when I was about 10 years old, my um, Girl Scout troop took a trip to New York City, to Broadway, my very first time. And I'd grown up on show tunes, because my mom is a big lover of show tunes, so I was so excited to experience the magic of Broadway in real life, up, up close and personal. And we went to see Annie. And I went with my best friend, Heather, who happens to be a redhead. So we felt really like connected to this show. And we were just amazed at the magic of it all. And we came back, and we decided that we were going to take on the world of theater. We were going to produce Annie in my carport for the whole neighborhood. So of course, Heather would play the part of Annie because she's like an adorable little redheaded 10-year-old girl. So it was perfect. Um, I, not being blessed a ginger, would play the parts of everyone else. <laughs> and I was very excited about this idea. I couldn't wait to uh, be adorable little Molly, the youngest, cutest orphan. But I also was going to be Sassy Pepper, who was the oldest orphan that bossed the other girls around. But I also would be mean, nasty Miss Hannigan, who ran the orphanage, and I could kind of channel my alter ego and be a mean person. But I could also take a break and be the lovely Miss Farrell and win the heart of Oliver Warbucks. This was a great plan until it was time to start rehearsals. And I realized that I had to play the lovely Miss Farrell while also playing Oliver Warbucks. And things got weird. And there were times that oldest orphan Pepper was being sassy to little adorable orphan Molly. And uh, it just got harder and harder to play out all these scenes with just one person. It was this experience that I realized the power of a team. Because I have limits to what I can do as one person. And you do as well. It takes a lot of humility to recognize that we need others to reach our goals. Now, I am extremely blessed. For the past 10 years, I have been the director of an amazing team. Not just a team, but a team of teams. So our Enactus team here at Roberts Wesleyan College, formerly known as SIF, or Students in Free Enterprise, is a team of project leaders, um, directors, and competition present presenters. And so it's a team of teams. And I get to help direct these team of teams. And the students, I believe, grow more in this experience of being on teams and leading on teams than anything I teach them in the classroom. Now, the classroom learning, it's really valuable. They take those principles and they put them to work when they work on their teams. But it's in their teams that they learn their limits. And when I put them working with people that are different from them, that's when they, they really learn to value all different kinds of people. So I tend to take our project leaders and I ask our project managers to serve alongside, like a lot of my, my students that come to Roberts are a little bit like me when I was 10. Now I'm not saying that they're immature, I'm saying that they don't always know their limits. And they think they can take on a whole project themselves. I ask them to work with a partner. And I usually give them someone who is very different than them. And they don't like it. <laughs> 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 
A lot of times they don't know this person, they don't trust this person, this person has a different work ethic, a different style of working than they do, and they're not so sure that they're gonna make great partners. A few years ago, I had two Elevate leaders. Now, Elevate is one of our most impactful projects that we do as an Enactus team. And for Elevate, we bring students from the inner city, and we bring them onto campus because over half of the students in our local city of Rochester don't graduate from high school. And we want to change that. So we bring them to campus so they can see what is it like to be a college student. And it takes over 100 volunteers to make this project happen. So the project managers of Elevate have high stakes. And I had asked two <laughs> students to be our project manager. One was an athlete, very popular, very connected on campus, also a bit of a dreamer, a visionary, who could picture Lecrae coming to perform for our students. And just imagine just really just blowing the doors off the limits of this project. Over here, I had a student very hardworking, very organized, very detail-oriented. She had her deadlines, her time frame, and she had experience in this project. She had been involved in it for the two years previous, so she knew what she was doing. She also knew that she was frustrated by this visionary over here who had these big dreams and was so focused on them that he was not operating within her time frame, and she was frustrated. Meanwhile, over here, we have this student who is networking and recruiting all these students to come and help, but he's missing deadlines, and he's missing meetings, and he's frustrating his teammate. This is where I get to do my job of bringing these different people together and my coworkers doing their job of bringing these people together and helping them see the value of one another, of saying, if we do everything this way, just by the book, by the deadlines, with all the details, we're going to forget that it takes 100 volunteers to make this event happen. And we're going to need someone that's out there in the community that's getting to know, you know, spreading the vision of what we're trying to accomplish and trying to, to make Elevate better. And over here, if we blow off all the deadlines and we don't pay attention to the details and we don't check the rules, we don't check in with risk management and other folks around campus about how things need to get done, then uh, this is going to be the last year we have Elevate. And we'll be limited in the number of students we can reach in the future. So these two students, through the months, um, they had one of the most successful Elevates in the history of our team, bringing their two very different personalities together. Do you know what else happened? They became really good friends, really good friends. They went on to do great things. You know what's really funny? This kid over here is now in the military, <laughs> where he he is a, a leader in the military where he, has, he really has a greater appreciation for order and detail and deadlines and structure. Where did he learn that? From his co-project manager. Over here, this student went on to be the president of our team. She was one of our, our most successful presidents. She, she's now uh, working in, in the um, healthcare field and making a difference in the lives of people there. And she has become an expert networker, connecting with people that are different from her because she's learned to appreciate people and their different gifts and talents and abilities. When we work in teams, we are being humble because we recognize our limits. And we learn to value people who are different than we are. But we also, working in a team also gives us courage to do things that we didn't think we were capable of doing. This is also something I get the privilege of seeing all the time. A few years ago, we were preparing our competition team. So our students take their projects that they do throughout the school year, and they work on a presentation that they're going to do for CEOs across the country. And they're going to try to share with them the results of their projects. It takes a lot of preparation and kind of perfecting those details. And in front of this, behind the students who are presenting, we have an audio, like a, a video presentation. Now you can see that there's a very simple presentation behind me, and it was actually created by a coworker. See, power of a team. Because this is not my strength. 
I'd rather be out here. But we need that to go to competition. And we kind of lacked people on our team who were good at creating those visuals this year. So I recruited a, a, a couple of brothers, twins actually, who needed a few extra credits to graduate on time. So we made a deal. I said, you know, you can learn how to work on this audiovisual this presentation, and you're going to get some really tangible skills that you're going to need as you go into the business world. And, and you know, that will be a, an independent study, and, and you'll be able to graduate on time, and you'll learn a really valuable skill, and we'll have something valuable to bring to competition. Now, they were nervous because they didn't have experience doing this. But there was another person on their team with them, a sophomore. Now, these guys are seniors. This girl is a sophomore but she knows a few things about video. So she starts teaching them, and they know their limits. So they start to humble themselves. They choose to value the strengths of their teammate. They start listening to her deadlines and her instructions, and they do things that are uncomfortable, and they make some things that are downright awful looking. And she has to tell them to go back to the drawing board and do it again when they've spent hours and hours creating it. But in the end, the presentation that they made took our team to third place in the nation out of over 450 teams across the country. Because they knew their limits. They chose to be humble. They valued the strengths of someone different than them. And being with others gave them courage to do something that they didn't think they could do on their own. Now, being part of a team also gives you strength when you're weak. A few months ago, I got a call from my brother, and I was immediately nervous because it wasn't my birthday. I knew immediately something was wrong. And he knew that that's how it feel, because the very first thing he said to me was, Carrie, it's OK, don't be worried. And then he told me that my mom had fallen and hit her head. Turns out that she hit the back of her head on a curb and had a brain hemorrhage. And I immediately, upon hearing that news, got in my car and drove six hours down just outside of New York City to see her because we heard she was being rushed to a major medical center where she might be undergoing brain surgery. And honestly, we didn't know if that night we would lose my mom. And um, there were times I thought, this was not a good idea to drive by myself <laughs> feeling this way. I need a team. When I got to the hospital, I had a team. My brother was there. And my brother is really great at staying calm under pressure. Fortunately, my mom made it through the night. She actually did not need surgery, but it was clear that she was, was going to have a long road of recovery. She spent the next two weeks in the ICU. Now, this is down near New York City. I live and work in Rochester, New York. This was going to be complicated. Um, her sister, my aunt, lives nearby. And she is really great at asking detailed medical questions. She's not afraid to say embarrassing things to the doctor, like, it looks like this bag has blood in it. Uh, should you take care of that? You know, she, she just, <laughs> she's just not afraid to, to call them out and say, are, are you doing that right? Are you sure you should be putting that hot compress right there? Because it looks like that's irritating my sister. She has a boldness with people in authority that I needed. My brother had a calmness under pressure that I needed. My other aunt is amazing at research. Now, she lives in Florida, but she is constantly on her computer doing research for me about traumatic brain injuries and the results of those, the different kinds of treatments, researching different nursing centers and rehab facilities, sending me the ratings side by side. Because I'll be honest, the last several weeks, I have been overwhelmed with the decisions that have come as a result of this near tragedy. But because I've been part of a team called my family, <laughs> we've been able to get through it together. Aren't we glad that we were all put in part of a team? Now, sometimes that team can frustrate us because they're different, right? They do things differently. There have been times that, that, that my team has frustrated me. But ultimately, I would not make it through without them. When we are part of a team, we recognize our limits. We're humbled. 
We learn to value people who are different than we are. Teams give us courage to do things that we didn't think we could do on our own. And teams give us comfort because we aren't alone in times of difficulty and challenge. Um, 25 years ago, over 250 people received a message in the mail. And in that message, it had the verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 11, that talk about two are better than one, for they have a better return for their work. These verses tell us that pity the one who falls and is alone because there's no one to help him up. That one person is easily overcome by an adversary, but two can stand against him, and that three, a cord of three strands, is not quickly broken. Those verses that came from my wedding invitation remind us of the power of team. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. We're being taped, so I'm going to bring the mic to you. Thank you, uh, Carrie, for sharing the stories and uh, tips for us. So you, in some of the stories, you shared the beginning and the end in the sense of there was a lot of conflict and different personalities, and then the end result was amazing. Um, could you share, as a leader or a coach, what are some tactics you use to help them through that journey of building a relationship and working together? Yeah, absolutely. One of my experiences is that when that tension comes, people want to quit. People want to back away from the team because they are either personally offended or they feel like their work isn't being valued or they just they, they can't see the value of the way the other person is doing it. And, and I have students that want to quit their leadership positions every semester because they're just being pushed too hard and the conflict is difficult. So, so part of it, I think, is coming alongside and listening and, and validating that their concerns are real, that there is true conflict, that there, there really is... Um, you know, that they, they may have been slighted or offended or hurt or, or violated. There were times that, you know, people's, they would make meetings and someone wouldn't show. That's a violation of, you know, of that agreement. So recognizing that, listening, being empathetic, and then helping them to kind of treasure hunt the other person and say, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. You know, I, I just taught this on Friday from 1 Corinthians 13 that talks about love hopes all things, believes all things. To me, that's love assumes the best. So we need to assume the best about the person we're working with and not assume that they're trying to undermine us, that they're trying to be not thoughtful of us, but that, they are, that we are a team and we have the same goals and um, helping people to kind of value those things that are different. But recognizing you know, their concerns is real. I think sometimes it's easy for us to just want people to get over things when they're not, and I don't think we help them when we do that. Yeah. Another question? Dave's getting a workout. We're going to make him run around. Um, so you've been talking about teams kind of in an organizational sense. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about how some of those principles apply to a personal, your personal life as well? Certainly, absolutely. Well, I ended by sharing verses that came from my wedding invitation. And um, I think it's interesting the way opposites attract. Right? So some of our most close relationships are with someone who's very different from us. And I think similar principles apply of, of choosing to see the best, of assuming the best about the people that we're in close relationships with, not starting with, man, they're out to get me, or they're really trying to hurt me, or you know, they're trying to undermine whatever it is that I'm trying to do. So, you know, my husband is here in, in the audience, and there are times that I might feel like that, or he might feel like that. Boy, you know, she really is not being thoughtful of me right now, or gosh, he really is, is getting in the way of what I'm trying to get done. So it starts with stopping, first, our thoughts that are, are negative about what's happening, and choosing to remember that you're a team, and, um, and choosing to see the value. What is it, what is it I, I always come back to, what is it that I first appreciated and fell in love with about my husband? I loved his sense of adventure. I loved the way he challenged me. I loved the way he pushed me. And sometimes when he do, does those things now, I'm annoyed. <laughs> 
You know, I don't want to be pushed anymore. I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to change those plans. And then I have to remember, this is why I fell in love with him. This is one of the things that my greatest growth, just as I shared with my students, my greatest growth comes from people who push me who are not like me. And I think that's very relevant in our personal relationships. Those who are closest to us, boy, they know how to push our buttons, don't they? <laughs> but they also know how to comfort and come along us and support us through difficult times and through challenges, so. Time for one more question. Bless you. <laughs> Right. Um, can you talk about the clarity or the importance of the purpose? Because as a team, you're coming together and yes. trying to accomplish something. It better be worth something, right? So, thank you. I think that's most helpful when you remind teammates who are not getting along of why, why they're doing what they're doing. You know, what is the what is the bigger picture? So particularly when it comes to our Elevate project, which is honestly a project where the most things break down because it's the most complicated and the stakes are really high. So we always have to, it, for us, it always goes back to the kids, right? The kids in the city that need our help. And if we're reminded of who we're doing this for, why we're trying to accomplish these difficult goals, makes it a little easier to persevere through some of those challenges, the many challenges that we face. Because at the end of the day, even though you know, this student leader's priority was getting Lecrae to come, and this student leader's priority was making sure we had a detailed agenda and get things on time, they both wanted to see you know, kids uh, have hope for their futures through this project. So I think coming back to that why, that big picture of what is it that we're trying to accomplish together, that's, that's where we um, overcome some of the challenges and really discover the power of the team. Thank you for your question. Let's uh, thank Carrie once more for sharing with us. Our second presenter is um, Mark Concordia. Mark's been with us five years. He's an associate professor of criminal justice, and he's the director of the Homeland Security and Applied Intelligence Program. And if Mark looks familiar, you've probably seen him on TV. Every time anything happens around the world, Mark's there. He's interviewed, and he's a, he's a good face and a good voice for Robert Swesley and college. He's going to speak to us today on assessment teams as a restorative approach to counteracts of target violence. Let's welcome Mark. Thank you. Good morning. Before I begin, I, I do need to warn you that um, my talk today is going to touch on some emotional topics. It's going to talk, it's going to touch on homicide, suicide. It's going to touch on active shooters in our schools, and mass shootings. So if that is too much for you, or that may act as a trigger, I won't be offended if, if you leave now. But it's not just going to be about that. It's going to be about hope. Hope that together, working as teams, we can come together as a community and prevent these acts of targeted violence that I'm going to be talking about today. So again, if this is too much for you, I won't be offended, you can leave. Nighttime snowfall. It's, it's funny how just something like this, watching these snowflakes can bring back memories. It can bring back wonderful memories. And it did for me, for most of my life, when I would look at these at nighttime, in the light, these huge snowflakes, I would think back about Christmases with my father and my family, caroling, you know, those nights where it was so cold outside that you could hear the snow crunch, and these snowflakes were like boulders. And when they landed, you could look and see the diversity within each snowflake. But now, when I look at these snowflakes, it brings me back to a different period of my life. Not the wonderful memories of Christmas with my father and my family, but standing in a, in a driveway in the winter of 2002 in a small farmhouse 
in the town of Greece, working as a police officer. I was called to that house because an individual living there was depressed, had feelings of overwhelming despair, and was thinking of taking his life. So, as a police officer, I had to respond. And through the course of that day, we made the decision that he needed to be transported to a psych ED for um, evaluation. But that's about all I could have done in my role as a law enforcement officer. So he was transported and life went on. Life went on for me and life went on for him and his family. That same day I learned that this should have been a happy time in his life. He just experienced the birth of his first son, but yet he had so many challenges in his life that he felt that he needed to end it. Now we'll fast forward seven years later. Same snowfall, this time the winter of 2010. I stood in that same driveway, but it was a very different reason. That man that just took the life of his seven-year-old son, sorry, <laughs> this is emotional for me, but it's important, and then he took his own life. And I stood in the driveway in the exact same snowfall as the medical examiner took out the body of a seven-year-old boy, I asked why. How could this happen, God? And I went back seven years earlier, and I was there, and I thought to myself, what could I have done? Is there anything? What happened in that seven-year period that made this man decide that it was a rational choice to take the life of his son and then his own? I was haunted by that for many years to come. But I understood now, what I understand now that I didn't understand then, sitting in that driveway, was that God had a plan for me. That this stitch in this tapestry of my life would create a passion in me that would bring me here to Roberts Wesleyan College and use this experience and other experiences to make meaningful change in our community, and that's what we're doing. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. So I sat again in that driveway and asked why, how could this happen? And what I've come to learn through my 22 years in law enforcement and uh, working with the Joint Terrorism Task Force on uh, preventing terrorism is that we, we don't fail as a community in one major catastrophic event. We fail in small incremental steps. Nobody wants these things to happen. We give it our all to stop these tragedies, but we're doing it in our own systems. We're doing it in a siloed environment. We lack the ability to come together, not when something bad happens, but before a tragedy occurs where all systems can come together and share. And what I learned, of course, on that day in 2010 is that we failed. Law enforcement failed. Our mental health system failed. And eventually, our family court system failed. But it's very hard to get individuals to admit failure. And this is what I've learned, that the first step in meaningful change is to admit that we failed. It's very difficult to get executives or people who do their, uh, their job and think that they're doing an, the best job possible to sit back and say, no, wait a minute. We have to change. And as a community, we can change because there is hope. And what I learned, that this does not have to be the new normal. What we're seeing with active shooters and in our, uh, in our schools and in our places of commerce and our employment, this does not have to be the new normal. I think as a society, we feel it has to be, that we can't do anything to change this. But what I learned 
is that there is a system that's out there. That's a system that's been around for 30 years plus, and it's called threat assessment and management. Threat assessment and team management, okay? Go back to our, our philosophy and our concept of teams coming together as a society, as a stakeholders to prevent acts of targeted violence. So threat assessment, what is it by definition? This is what it is. Threat assessment is nothing more than gathering the right information, asking the right questions, a more holistic approach to circumstances. Not only asking about, from a law enforcement perspective, is there a crime that's been committed, but asking what's happening in this person's life that's brought them to this point where they may be on a pathway to violence. Understanding the risk factors that we share and the warning behaviors that somebody may be thinking about using violence as an acceptable resolution to their pain. But it doesn't end there because I found in my career that we're pretty good as a community coming together in a dynamic situation. And we can bring all our systems and everybody's content to work with each other. But what happens when the police officer gets in his police car and then drives away? What happens when that individual is released from the psych ED? What happens when they walk out of that family court? Nobody knows. And they're left out there, again, to return maybe to their pain and their anguish without support of a community. That's where management comes in. And these are two very interrelated processes. And that's what we advocate. Not only do we come together in times of crisis, but we stay there. We come alongside the people that need us the most. It's very restorative. It's a restorative philosophy. And what we learn is that the harshest punishment does not always equal prevention. Sometimes it makes situations worse. So what we do is we need to balance. We need to balance the needs of the individual who's presenting as a risk along with the needs of the community in terms of safety. Because if we don't restore, meet the needs of the person who is at risk, who's in pain, who is suffering despair and desperation, we're never truly going to be safe. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we promote. So what are we doing? So again, I told you that that day that I stood in that driveway and I asked God why, I know why God has brought me to that situation. That was a stitch in this tapestry. So when I came here to Roberts, I had a platform. Roberts Wesleyan College believed in me, believed in my vision, and we started the Justice and Security Institute which is a means for us to work in the community. And when I say us, it's a team. It's not just me, it's my dean, it's the president, it's, it's Dave who supports me and our students. Our students get involved in research, mental health research, active shooter uh, training research, threat assessment research. And we use, I use this along with other partners in our community to train to advocate for this team to come together to prevent these acts of targeted violence. And what are we doing? We're, we have five school districts now that we're tra have trained our, our training. And the community itself is listening to us. We're, we're ab about to create, in a very short period of time, I think we have November as one of our deadlines, it's to create a community-based Threat Assessment and Team Management Committee, where all of the stakeholders from across the county come together and help to prevent acts like what I just explained earlier on, and acts of targeted violence. We're making strides in our community. And that's the passion, and that's the reason God brought me to that very tragic and emotional period of my life. What we learn from threat assessment, and this is key to this team concept and this case management concept, 
is that violence, this particular type of violence that we call targeted violence or premeditated violence, predatory violence, there's a process that an individual goes through. And because there is a process, there's points of intervention. And because it's a process, what also we learn is that these individuals do not ascend this pathway to violence in a vacuum. People around them know what's happening. And because of this, we can recognize the warning behaviors early. And threat assessment and team management promotes those concepts. What do we know? That we know that from, a, from research that 81% of the time others knew of an impending school shooting. We work in the community to break down silos and to get people out of their bunkers and to come together to identify these individuals early, these individuals who are hurting, who need us. This is what we advocate for. This is what we train. This is the future. So what can we do? Together, we can care about each other. We can pay attention to our colleagues, our coworkers, our family members. We can be there when they're hurting. We're very good at responding when someone may be physically ill or somebody may injure themselves. But when someone is suffering emotionally or psychologically, we tend to take a step back. We become a bystander. And what we advocate for is don't do that. Listen, ask, become an upstander. Only through this methodology, only through this philosophy, can we really become a true community that we caretake for each other, that we're not afraid if somebody is suffering from a mental illness because we know mental illness does not equal violence. We have to be brave enough to ask that question, how are you and what can I do for you? And not only be brave enough to ask that question, but actually listen and then be brave enough to take that step. But that's why our work is so important because what we're providing to school districts, to communities, is a team collaboration that is not punitive, it's restorative. It allows for you for an outlet. It allows for a team of stakeholders that you can have faith and trust in that we're here to help, that our community has finally come together to prevent acts of targeted violence. So again, when I look at that snowfall, it does bring me back. I'm still dealing with the, the scars of that day, but I found that passion in that pain. And I'm blessed to have a team around me here at Roberts Wesleyan College that also believes in me and believes in my passion. Thank you. We have time for at least one question. Mark, Mark thank yeah. you for that great presentation. On the, on the team approach that you're anticipating for the community, mm -hmm. could you talk about whether there's the role of uh, the faith community uh, to be at the table and how they might speak into people's lives who are in these kinds of needs? Yes, absolutely, and in fact, we're, we're identifying uh, a stakeholder that could, from the faith community, again, it's tough because you, you have to, you can't pick every faith community to be sitting at the table, but there, we're identifying individuals that may have the ability to work across faiths, uh, to sit at our table, and to be part of this advisory team because sp the spiritual aspect is a huge inhibitor. It can be a huge inhibitor to violence, but and sometimes when it's, when it's corrupted, 
it could also be an accelerator. So we do need that spiritual voice. And so the concept of a team, right, is a multidisciplinary team of stakeholders who understand the resources of their particular community, that understand the resources uh, of their particular agency, and they bring those resources to the table when we identify someone that's in need. So yeah, we do, we do have the spiritual faith community that we're gonna try to engage in this. One more question. Thank you for your talk, very, very good. I'm wondering, what about the radicalized people who see it as their ideology to go out and kill and destroy large numbers of people? How do you deal with them? Well, I worked counterterrorism for 13 years. And what I realized that terrorism is just one form of targeted violence and it manifests in different forms like we talked about school shootings uh, domestic violence, homicides, murder, suicides. It's the same pathway, right? So what we have to understand is why, what factors in that person's life makes them at risk to accept that violent message. And it's, it's really what we say, it's when we used to work terrorism, the cause, this violent ideology or the cause wasn't really the cause. It was a complex factor, uh, complex mix of factors both biopsychosocial of the individual. So this is what threat assessment does. It helps us recognize what those risk factors are so we can intervene and holistically intervene. If it's mental health, it's mental health. If it's spiritual, it's spiritual. So there's always going to be uh, some organization or some concept that advances uh, an ideation of violence or has a, a narrative. Uh, we, it's hard to fight that narrative because people believe in it. So we work on, again, restoring the individual, giving them coping skills that they can be resistant and resilient to that message. Quick question and a quick answer. Quick answer. <laughs> Have you met me, Dave? <laughs> So you're talking about the community and how people can be active. How can we as college students be active in being part of this community? Again, upstander, you know, care about the student that's maybe marginalized or care about the individual who seems a little strange, who you don't want to talk to. One thing that we do is we create a culture of shared responsibility and connectedness where nobody eats alone, right? We care about each other. If someone appears to be in trouble emotionally, in despair, we try to get them help. Just become an upstander. That's how you can help. Again, just care. We, you know, we, we need to be, we're, we are a connected community here on Roberts. We, we can, we, that same connectedness needs to be throughout our community. So that's what you can do. Spread that message. Become an upstander. Let's thank Mark once more for sharing this. Our third presentation is, is by a team from the nursing department. Sam Brazos has been here 18 years, and she is a social professor of nursing and director of the RN to BS degree completion nursing program. And Sharon Davis has been here 15 years, and uh, she is an associate professor of nursing and the director of the traditional undergraduate nursing program. Their topic is compassion as a bridge to cultural sensitivity, innovation strategies for nurse educators. Let's welcome them as they come to share with us. Thank you for being here. Sam and I presented our research at Indiana Wesleyan University in June. What we share with you this morning are our stories. Our goal was to provide an opportunity for our students to be immersed in another culture. As we drove around the circle of small one-story homes on the reservation in Salamanca, some in shambles, some with visible repairs in progress, we listened to Barbara as she told us the story of the Seneca Nation's people, how their ancestral lands were lost with the construction of the Kinsua Dam. These small manufacture homes were replacements given to them by the government. In, in 1794, 
chief corn planter had, pl had granted 15,000 acres along the Allegheny River in recognition of his loyal support and protection of the Pennsylvania settlers. The land grant became the nation's oldest standing treaty, which George Washington granted to chief corn planter and his ancestors forever. This is where the land, the land of the Seneca Nation's people lived, and they lived as sovereign. The Kinsua Dam project was developed as a control for Pittsburgh, where the three rivers, the Monongahela, the Ohio, and the Allegheny converge. It's known as the Golden Triangle, the central business district of Pittsburgh. Over the years, it had been devastated by flooding. The Kinsua Dam controversy raged from 1936 until 1958, where the Seneca Nation fought in Congress, in the courts, and in the press to prevent construction of the dam. Despite their efforts, the dam project went forward, and 9,000 acres of the Seneca's habitable land, ancestral homes, farms, community centers, hunting and fishing grounds, and burial plots, were, including chief corn planters' remains, were flooded when the dam became functional. One observer stated, I watched the dam being built after they relocated the Indian reservation from the valley. I cried when I saw the homes being bulldozed and burned. 90-year-old Rovino Ab Abrams was among the Seneca natives forced from the farms onto smaller properties on higher ground after the Kinsua Dam's construction. She continued to talk to her sons about life before the removal. As a community, the Seneca Nation recognizes the last Saturday in September, which is today. They call it Remember the Removal Day. This solemn time allows the nation to travel to the site where the exhumations of elders occurred and a communal walk gives them comfort as a community. They call what they have experienced intergenerational trauma, passing down stories from generation to generation, reliving the experiences. Driving around these small prefab houses in varying states of decline, listening to this Seneca woman we could sense the despair that followed the desecration of the nation's ancestral lands, lands. Sam and I both remember she was from the Wolf Clan. She had a wolf figure hanging, hanging from the rear view mirror in her car. Her keychain had a wolf symbol on it, and the coffee mug on her desk in the health center was a, a wolf cup. We learned each Seneca native is born into one of eight tribes, four bird, four animal. This is who they identify with as their family. Barbara was proud to be a wolf. The other major event we learned about was the establishment of the American Indian boarding schools. General Richard Pratt established the first school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and is known for using the phrase, kill the Indian to save the man. These schools were run military fashion, and the Indian children were taken from their parents, put in uniforms, and forbidden to speak their native language. Many of the Seneca Nation people we interacted with had family who had been at the Thomas Indian School, also known as the Thomas Asylum for Orphan and Destitute Children. It was located near Irving, New York, on the Cattaraugus Indian Reservation. Listening to the elders recall the memories of time in a boarding school was disheartening. Again, the sense of devastation of the heart of a nation of these people. You can see that, Re that General Richard Pratt said, and in Indian civilization, I'm a Baptist because I believe in immersing the Indians in our civilization, and when we get them under holding them there until they're thoroughly soaked. The thought was the Indians were savage. Unlike most federally recognized tribes whose lands are held in trust by the United States, the, native, the Seneca Nation owns its own lands. They are sovereign. 
They have a strong sense of independence and are determined to heal as best they can from the trauma they've experienced. Today, the Seneca Nation is infusing their culture and strength and resilience into everything they do, from health clinics, fish hatcheries, re reinstalling the Seneca language into education and on road signs, building strong recreational centers, developing drug and alcohol recovery programs. In their words, we want to control our destiny. Sam and I continue to learn about these folks and felt very pri privileged to learn what they had experienced and recognized that, that as we were trying to help our students, these experiences would give them insight. So we wanted to add, we knew we were down in the area where we could add a second cultural immersion experience if we were able to visit an Amish and work with the Amish in a health clinic. So I decided to volunteer at an Amish health fair in Rochester, in uh, south of Rochester in Cataraugus County. And it, there's a large percentage of Amish families in this county. The health fair was led by an NP, and she had established herself as a trusted member of the healthcare community as well as the Amish community. The fair was billed as preventative approaches for the following services. Screening would be done for, as, with mammograms, blood pressure checks, cholesterol screening, immunization questionnaires, cardiac screening, pelvic exams, and PAPs. And I had to keep in mind that culture is a shared meaning and values and attributes of a community. And so I knew I had a lot to learn as I approached that fair that day. A little bit more about the NP who served as the coordinator of the fair. She was viewed in this community as the doctor. And she indeed was, because she was a doctorate of nursing practice. But it, in the real world, that community was thinking of her as what we would perceive as a medical doctor. The NP was acutely aware of understanding the viewpoint of the elderly and how essential that was in taking in the cultural heritage and beliefs in order to get to health independence for that community. So the Amish work very hard. They consider health very important because they need to be healthy to work in the fields and have strong family responsibilities as well as a very strong spiritual well-being. Health decisions are not made in isolation. Now historically, the elders decreed what health actions they seemed to be appropriate, but that's changing significantly in most of the Amish cultures. So I want to go back to my story for a minute now. Now, my assignment that day at the health fair was assisting a nurse practitioner who was visiting to do pelvic exams and breast self-exam teaching. And we were seeing one patient right after another. It was very busy. My role was prepping the women for the exam, including what the procedure would feel like, what specimens we would take. Many of these women had never had a pelvic exam before. Most of their births took place in their home by a midwife. So one of our first patients had to check with her husband to see if it was okay to have the examination. And um, he decided that it was, but he needed to sit in the room for the procedure. So that was kind of a first for me in my practice to have the um, husband there in the room with that. I had to keep reminding myself, okay, Sam, this is a different culture and cultural habits, different family roles, all of those kinds of things related to the Amish culture. So Mrs. Yoder was our, ne our next patient, and she was a mom of 17 children. Birth control measures aren't routinely practiced in the Amish culture, so large families result. She was in her late 50s. What struck me that day, her skin was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. She'd never had a preventative pelvic exam, so I began by explaining the procedure. However, I noted, I kept noting on her paperwork, 17 children, wow. Um, and, and I was just amazed with that, so I shared that amazement with her. And that is when she looked up from the exam table and she met my eyes and she said, we don't have TV. And, and we all laughed. Um, 
and, and I noted her smile and her sense of humor, and it was awesome. And as we talked during and after the exam, I learned that she had 16 living children. One child had passed away about a year before, and I asked her to share what happened. She explained that the little tot was working out in the field. He was actually four years old. The day was beautiful out, and his job was to load his wheelbarrow with sod and bring the sod in near the barn, and he dropped dead. She went on to explain with sudden, unexplained death such as that was, a medical examiner is called in to review the case. The TOTS death certificate read hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it is one of the most common inherited cardiac disorders. The mom's concern that day was the following. What about her remaining 16 children? Her questions were, who's next? Do her other children carry the gene? What should she do? And she, should she insist that each child see a cardiologist? And there was a cardiologist on site that day at the health fair volunteering his time. I want to say a little bit more about that defect of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In the Amish population, many carriers, um, but not all kids will have that expression of the gene. If both parents have the gene, then it's possible that one of the kids or more could have the expression of the gene. An interesting point I found in my research, a simple pulse oximetry, which is totally non-invasive, on a newborn could potentially detect small changes in blood oxygen that would indicate a serious cardiac defect, avoiding the catastrophic consequences that we saw that day. Um, with her story. Because the Amish are forbidden to marry outside of the community, I want you to think about this for a minute. It's called the founder effect with this gene of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The mutated gene perpetuates and it flourishes and it never gets a chance to get diluted out to the general population. So back to my story of Mrs. Yoder. We spent time just listening, and that's what Nightingale taught us. Listen and be present. Mrs. Yoder explained to me that her culture preferred to handle death quietly. Each family member has a job to do, building a pine casket, making the food, carving a simple headstone, digging the grave. Mrs. Yoder shared with me that she knows her child is in heaven and is experiencing no more suffering. So I need to wrap up my story in the interest of time here. We were able to get the cardiologist at the health fair to see all of Mrs. Yoder's remaining 16 children for evaluation that day. I know that one child was sent to a nearby university hospital for further evaluation. So I sat in the barn that this health fair took place at the end of the day and did some reflecting. The Amish were beautiful, gentle, kind folk. And I thank God for the opportunity that I was able to enter Miss Yoder's life, even if it was for that short time. What did she gain from me? I hope that by presencing, I was able to demonstrate the connection that nurses make with the people they serve. So Sharon and my goal was to be able to provide an opportunity for our students to have this cultural immersion and make a connection so in the words of President Porterfield, we wanted our students to connect their heads with their hearts, with their hands. And it was a great experience. Thanks for listening today. We have time for a couple of questions. Hi, I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about the students' reaction, experience, or any reflection they shared. One of the things that we, we noticed uh, in the first, in, in the last class we've taken is that the students said, we never learned any of this in the history books. None of this is in the history books. And Sam and I had the same um, feeling that this was, was not something we knew. And as we have worked with them and learned more, we understand the Native Americans and what they've been through. They pass it down. 
They experience the trauma, and it, and it shows in their life, their diet, their, their um, challenges, and it makes us more, more better informed as nurses. But it's not in the history books. One, one last question. Thank you. I'm wondering what follow-up has been done for those who were in residential schools and are now out. Um, in Canada, we have the same problem, and we found that many of these now adults' parents don't know how to be parents because they never learned it. They were away from family, and so the whole mental health issue is so important. It is, and that's where the drugs and the challenges have been. Um, I'm a Canadian as well, and, and when I was re when doing the research, I saw that one of the prime ministers had made a very similar statement to General Pratt. Um, what we're seeing in the Seneca Nation, because that's the group we're working with, is an, a determination by the younger people who've had their grandparents and the other folks that lived this, um, trying to teach them, but trying to say, what can we do? And they're trying to strengthen their culture, trying to bring back the pieces of their culture that strengthen them to try to help them get over it. But it is a huge problem that has devastated many lives. And the chief nursing officer that we worked with at the Seneca Nation, she had two sons, and she talked about how important it was for her to make sure that she started at square one with exposing them to the culture and the cultural practices and understanding those atrocities that had happened before that. There's one more question, Dave, right here. So I think within the Rochester community, there's also a lot of diversity of experience. And I'm curious what uh, students took away as far as how do you apply these ideas in Rochester specifically with you know, differences between the inner city experience and the suburban experience and how that affects your health care. Well, in our literature, for as we were preparing for India, Indiana Wesleyan, we clearly saw over and over again in the literature, it's the immersion experiences that are going to make the difference, as opposed to studying from the textbook or, or whatever that uh, might be. And so, do you want to say anything? I think that what we're trying to do is to help them realize that until they understand the differences, so whether it's a difference in, in socioeconomic or a difference in ex life experience or whatever, to treat them like real people that have value and worth, and as a nurse, if you approach them that way, you treat them very differently. Let's thank uh, Sam and Sharon again for helping us. <laughs>